bit. Here we have the new exception page with a slightly different color scheme showing us an exception in a template. And here we have the compiled template. Uh, you only see what actually matters now. No more distractions like the huge line one we used to have, which was terrible. And on the bottom of the page, we now have the last few log messages, which I find very helpful for debugging. The not found page now shows the same information as the exception page. And of course, also the last few log messages at the bottom. And the documentation browser got a total redesign. Next up, the around action hook. This is a tricky one. It allows us to change how actions work. In this example, we locally assign the current controller to dollar underscore before calling the action with dollar next. This allows uh, all actions in the application to do this. No more my dollar self equals add underscore. And we're actually using this already for one-liners. And another hook, but a much simpler one. OK, imagine you have a custom handler for some serialization format. I'll be using Bison here. The specifics are not important. To use it with render, you actually have to specify the Bison and handler values. But what we really want is for the Bison value to become a bit more magical. It should imply the handler just like JSON does. The before render makes this very simple. You just uh, check if a Bison argument has been provided and add the handler. Basic argument rewriting. And another rendering feature, template variants. Imagine you have a partial template that gets included a lot like a menu bar. Now you want to do some A-B testing, maybe to try a different color scheme. For that, you can add a new variant of the menu bar template. Just use the same name and append a tag to the format. Here, highlighted in blue, and that's all. You've created a variant. From now on, this variant will get precedence whenever the variance dash value has been set to blue, like this hook does randomly. And help us got a lot cheaper. Yeah, it might not sound like much, but it's actually my favorite new feature. It will change how you use help us. Here we have an inline template. This is about as simple as it gets. But this is what it looked like in 4.0 after compiling. <laughs> yeah, there is very expensive boilerplate for every helper. It was terrible. And this is what it looks like in 5.0. Yes. <laughs> you can now have uh, as many helpers as you like. There is no cost. And if you want a helper for every HTML tag, that's not a problem anymore. And this one annoyed me for quite some time. Here we have a simple root with an optional placeholder called name. Slash login and slash login slash mango work just fine. But the problem is that in 4.0, optional placeholders only worked at the end of the root. So slash login did not work here. At 5.0, that has changed. Any placeholder can now be optional, and slash login finally works. 
RFC 7159. It's the new JSON spec. It was supposed to be a cleaner version of the old spec. Supposed. With the old spec, a JSON document could only be an object or an array. It was really simple. Now, with the new spec, JSON documents can be anything. Object, array, string, number, and even literal names. The re this results in some funny special cases, such as suddenly being able to render an undef value. Seriously, it results in a bare null, which is now a valid JSON document. Let's move on to something more fun, like the per message deflate extension for WebSockets. It allows WebSocket messages to be compressed. So far, it is only supported by Chrome, but I'm sure more will follow soon. This is the handshake request. The browser advertises that it supports the extension with a header here in green. And this is the handshake response from the server. Same header, also in green. I've done some benchmarking, of course. And for compressible formats like JSON, the results can be quite extreme. For this one, I've used a real-world JSON file generated by the GitHub API. It was 160 kilobytes originally and could be compressed down to 15 kilobytes. Of course, there's a trade-off. I've also done some concurrency tests with 10,000 WebSocket connections, and memory usage increased drastically, up to 300 kilobytes per connection. You will have to decide for yourself if it's worth it. Compression is always opt-in, and for the user agent, you activate it by setting a header. On the server side, you just call with compression. That was changed two days ago. It's pretty new. <laughs> SO reuse port. It's a new socket option. It allows multiple processes to have listened sockets with the same address and port combination. The reuse option enables it. Of course, there are portability problems. On BSD, only the last socket gets new incoming connections. So you can only use it for zero downtime restarts. On Linux, however, the kernel load balances between all processes, and you get a whole new way to build high-performance web servers. That is really cool stuff. I hope every one of you knows about the application secret. We use it to cryptographically sign the session cookie. This cookie is usually valid for one hour. In 4.0, whenever you uh, change the secret, it invalidated all existing sessions. So in 5.0, we've turned the secret into an array of secrets. You just add new secrets to the start of the array. The first one is then used to sign new sessions, but all of them are used to validate existing ones. And so on. This is called rotating secrets. Non-blocking bridges. This may look a bit complicated, but it's really simple. Here we have an action with a timer. This is a non-blocking operation. The timer fires after three seconds, and then a response is rendered. So far, that was impossible to do with bridges. But in 5.0, you can just return a false value to suspend the current route and call continue once your non-blocking operation is done. This one is actually bigger than it may look. Moto DOM internals have been completely redesigned. 
Here's an example for how it used to work. You selected a tag, the paragraph in blue, and then extracted the text in orange. But the comment was unreachable. So well, basically all comments were unreachable. In 5.0, we can extract and modify absolutely everything. After selecting the paragraph again, we now use the new contents method to get a collection of all notes it contains, text, and comment. There's also a shortcut. You can use array dereferencing to access notes directly and navigate between them with new methods like previous sibling. All nodes are module DOM objects. The node method can be used to check their type. Here we use all contents to get all nodes recursively and filter out the comments. These are all node types we have now. C data, comment, doc type, PI, raw, root, tag, and text. But there's also new ways for changing HTML. Here we select the text in blue and wrap a B tag around it. Almost the same here. We select the first paragraph, use next sibling to jump to the second one in blue, and wrap its content in an I tag. The strip method does the opposite. Here we use it to scrub out the B and I tags we just added. You might have noticed uh, that we're actually calling strip on a collection, which is what find returns. That is another new feature. If you call an unknown method on a collection, it will try to call that method on all of its elements. Content is another very important new method. You can use it to get or set the actual content of, for all node types. Next up, form validation. It took some time, but it's finally here. This is your everyday form using some tech helpers. This is the HTML it generates. Form validation usually works in three steps. Step one in blue, we check with has data if a form has actually been submitted. Step two in green, parameters are defined as required or optional with one or more checks. And step three in red, We'll check if validation failed with has error and render the form again if it did. That's all. Failed validation checks are picked up automatically by tag helpers and a field with error class gets added to the tag. That class can then be used to highlight elements with CSS. Of course, you can't have form validation without CSRF protection. So to protect a form, you just add an additional hidden input element with the CSRF field helper. That input element contains a token, which is also stored in the session, and which we can validate. In our action, we just call CSIF protect and check with has error if the token failed validation. And we are done. Last but not least, we have Minion. Yes, this guy. Minion is a job queue. You can use it to perform tasks in the background outside of the web server. Minion is not actually part of the modulicious distribution, just like Mango, it's a spin-off project. And you have to install it from CPAN. 
minion is based on Mango, and the plugin only needs a MongoDB connection string to work. Minion is tightly integrated into Modulicious. You add tasks right from inside the application and have full access to it. Our example task sleeps for five seconds and then uses the application logger. Once you have a task, you can start jobs from anywhere in your application with NQ. New worker processes are started with the worker command. You can have as many worker processes as you like. And they do not have to be on the same server. For job management, we currently use a job command. A web interface is planned for the future. You can do stuff like listing all jobs in the queue, and queue new jobs from the command line, or just check the details of a job. And that was it for today. Thank you.